hey, good morning, everybody. If you're joining us online, thanks for checking out Life Point today on the last day uh, that we will be Life Point Church, and we're really looking forward to being Devoted City starting next Sunday. So we're in this last week of a 10-week series <clears throat> where we've been reading the words of James, and here's what James has said over the last nine sessions that we've considered how to apply his word to our life. He's been telling us that our faith in God should affect our actions for God. Not that we earn God's love or that we earn God's favor, but when we say we have faith in God, it should affect the way we do all other things in life. It should affect the way we live and have relationships. It should affect the kind of employer, employee, mom, dad, child, uh, follower of Christ. It should affect how we spend our money. It should affect what we believe and support. When we say we have faith in God, it should have an impact on our day-to-day decisions. And that's why James wrote this letter was because the church was not respected in their community. The government did not respect them. They were under persecution most days. And he comes along and says, look, it's not always going to be easy to be a person of faith. And if you're going to be a person that has faith in Christ, you need to let it show by the way you live. When it's hard, when it's easy, when nobody sees, when people are against you, you still live out your faith day to day. And that's also what we're talking about in this last segment of James in James chapter five. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, the way that your words have spoken to us over this summer. As we've gotten deeper into the book of James and been convicted to live differently, to think differently, God, may you uh, convict us today. Anybody that needs to take a step today that you make it clear to them as I speak. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. So in James chapter five, at the end, which is the last chapter of the book of James, he revisits an idea or concept that he gave early on in chapter one. In chapter one, verses two and four, he says these words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So James revisits that idea when he gets to uh, chapter five. It doesn't make sense to rejoice when you have trials, but you do it anyway because it can bring the joy that goes past anything we can understand. And so today he's going to talk about some things that are sometimes hard to understand, hard to receive, and even harder to trust in. But that's what I want to help us with today. So I want to do a little participation. If you're comfortable doing this, turn to the person next to you, and I want you to give yourself a grade, A through F, just traditional grading, and answer this question. How patient are you? (laughs) Just take a moment. Give your, give, get, let the person beside you know your grade. So, um, do we have any A's, any A's in here? And you know you're an A. So now if you're with your, if you're with your spouse, tell them what you think they are. Don't do that. Do not do that. Uh, That's something y'all have to work on on your own. You can work it out later. But that's what James is going to start right off talking about. Just like when he says, look, when you have trials, considered an opportunity to have joy, that takes patience. And then in chapter 5, he says it clearly, beginning in verse 7 and going through verse 11, he says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke 
in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And now, He ends that section by saying the Lord is full of compassion and mercy because he's going to say some things coming up that's going to make some people doubt God's compassion and mercy, but he wants his people to know, look, you need to be patient. You need to learn how to wait. And he gives a few examples of what it means to be patient and wait. The first one is just a regular example of a farmer. Everybody could have related. Look, a farmer waits for spring rain, fall rains and spring rains. He needs two rains. He needs a rain when he plants and he needs rain before the harvest. He can't make it rain. And so he does his part and he plants and he patiently waits for God to make it rain so his crops can grow. Then he mentions the prophets. People called by God to speak truth. Now, here's the interesting thing about a prophet. A prophet speaks truth whether people want to hear it or not. So a prophet, he's speaking the Old Testament prophets. They would come along to God's people and they would speak truth from God to the people. More often than not, it was was in the way of warnings. And more often than not, it was one word they used and that was the word repent. That's a very difficult word for some people to hear. One time a lady got upset with me, uh, not here, years ago uh, when I was at the first church I ever served at and she was upset and she stated her case and it was over something that is so trivial. I'm not even going to tell you, but it was very trivial. It was a a doctrinal thing. And and I said, uh, you need to repent. It didn't go well. (laughs) It did not go well at all. I was I probably said it with a little bit of an attitude because I, I, you know, was young and had one and it didn't go well. She didn't like hearing that. It's hard to say the word repent. It's hard to receive the word repent, but prophets do that. And there's a part of us, every person that follows Jesus, that we need to be able to say to someone, hey, you need to repent, leave that behind and come towards Christ. That's very hard to do. That's why we're so insistent on people getting in community because it's in community among people that you do life with, among your friends, that it's still hard to hear, but it's easier to hear from somebody you know who loves you than just somebody saying, hey, I don't know you, but you need to repent. Usually that's not received well. And so James is saying, look, look how the farmer waits. Look how the prophets wait. And he's saying people that aren't patient, you know what they end up doing? He says that they grumble. I mean, that's not changed since the first century. Impatient people have this in common. They're negative. People who are, if you scored yourself an F on patience, you're probably negative. And have you ever noticed that negative people, they just attract each other? (laughs) I don't know if y'all have a secret handshake or if you have something. It's like, hey, I'm negative, you're negative. Let's be friends and be negative together. (laughs) And negativity, so impatience turns to negativity. Negativity turns to grumbling. And that's what James is saying. Don't grumble against each other because you're gonna be judged by the ultimate judge if you do that. He also gives an example of a guy named Job. If you know much about your Old Testament stories, Job was this very wealthy prosperous man who loved God, who followed God with all of his life, then Satan tried to take him out. Satan caused him to lose everything he had, all of his money, all of his wealth. He lost his health and then eventually lost all of his friends. And even his wife said, things are so bad for you. You just need to curse God and die. But Job, as a picture of patience, refused to curse God, never stopped believing, never stopped praying, never stopped knowing that God was going to deliver, that God was going to make things better, that God was going to give him clarity and understanding. And then what happened at the end of Job's life is recorded in Job 42. 
where it says the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. If Job had chosen not to be impatient and not trust God, look what he would have missed out on. Now, that doesn't mean that God's got an ending for all of us where we win the lottery. But I've been, I've been helping people follow Jesus for a long time, since before I wanted to be a pastor. And I've seen a lot of people walk away from God, just be frustrated and leave. And most of the time when people are frustrated with faith, it's because they go through this hard time where something they feel and what God wants them to do don't match up. And that comes for all of us. One day you're going to feel something. Those of you that are young in your faith, one day you're going to feel something and it doesn't match up with the words of God. And so then you have a choice. Am I going to go with God's word that I know is right or am I going to go with my feelings? And when people go with their feelings, they walk away from God forfeit whatever he's given them and they walk away because of their lack of patience. See, patience in the Lord is always a big payoff. Always. It may not be money and possessions, but it's always a big payoff. See, the big point is in the middle of Job's difficult times, he still was patient. In the middle of his bad circumstances, he was still patient. He didn't understand what was going on, but he trusted God anyway. And trusting God anyway is always the best bet. No matter what you're going through, no matter what's difficult, trusting him anyway is always the best bet, whether it works out your way or not. And that's what James is trying to help his readers understand. And then James moves from speaking uh, to the individual to verse 13, where he's starting to speak to uh, what the community of the church is supposed to look like. And he says this, beginning in verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Now, if you found yourself saying things like, I don't know what to do. Things are tough. It's getting worse. James tells us what we need to do in, this, in these few verses. He doesn't just say, hey, you need to be patient and deal with it. Things are rough in life. Just be patient and deal with it. He doesn't say that. <laughs> Here's what he says. If you're having trouble, here's what you need to do. You need to pray. If you're happy, you need to sing. I hope in every service you have an opportunity to pray through troubles and to sing. But I also hope that throughout your day-to-day life, when you have trouble, you can pray. You know people that can pray for you and with you. And when you're happy, you can sing songs of praise. See, singing is not just for these people that are very gifted on the stage. It's also for those of us who cannot sing a note. In my car, I am the best worship leader. I am. When I'm in my car, the right song comes on. I am leading worship. I'm leading myself in worship to God. But here's the beautiful thing. He hears it just like he hears these beautiful voices. He's not going, Donnie, you need to like do something. Could you go back to pray and stop the singing part? (laughs) He doesn't do that. It's just as beautiful to him, no matter what the notes sound like, because he's looking at our hearts. The word for happy that James uses is a Greek word that simply means to be of cheerful spirits in spite of circumstances. So are you happy? Are you cheerful in spite of your circumstances? Then sing songs of praise. And then he says, if you're sick, you need to get the leaders, the elders of the church to pray over you. Now, the whole teaching in the New Testament about healing uh, sometimes has been poorly taught. 
sometimes has been incorrectly interpreted, incorrectly applied. And so what happens, a lot of people might be afraid to talk about it. So maybe they'll say, hey, let's, let's just skip to the next part. But we can't ignore that James instructed the first century church and us that there is a time to pray for healing. There is a time, and he uses the the symbol of anointing with oil to do that and pray. See, the way we typically pray when there's a hardship is, God, get me out of this. Just get me out of this. I don't want this in my life. But there's another way you can pray too. You can say, God, help me learn. I remember a long time ago when I started college and I didn't know about the whole drop period until I got there. And I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. Like if I go through the first few weeks, I don't like it or I don't feel like I can do well. I can just drop it and nobody knows. I mean, eventually you can't do that all the time, but eventually somebody will find out, but nobody knows. It took me a while to figure out, you know, there's another option. Don't drop put out some effort and learn everything you could possibly learn. The same thing is true when we're going through hardship. We can get frustrated with God. We can walk away. We can, we can shake our fists at the sky and God can handle all of that. If that's what you've done. But we can also choose to say, whatever I'm going through and whatever's happened to me, God can take that, make me stronger, use me to help others or use me to mold me into what he wants me to to be. So you have a choice. Pray to get out of it or pray for God to use it. Both of those are valid prayers. God, get me out of this. God, take this away from me, but don't let me miss whatever you want me to learn through it. That's how God can take something tragic and turn it into something that points people to him. Several years ago, there's a, there's a surfer, her name's Bethany Hamilton. Uh, she, uh, there was a movie made about her life. A Christian girl, she was surfing, got attacked by a shark, lost an arm. And here's what she said. I have this thought every second of my life. Why me? Not negatively, like, why did this terrible thing happen to me? But more like, why did God choose me? And what does God have in mind for me? I don't pretend to have all the answers to why bad things happen to good people, but I do know that God knows all those answers. And sometimes he lets you know in this life. That's spoken from someone with strong faith who went through a tragedy. And this verse about anointing with oil and receiving healing has both encouraged and disappointed followers of Jesus since the day it was written down. It looks like a guarantee that whatever we do, if you get some oil put on your head and you're sick, then you're going to get healed. Is that true? Is that what that means? Well, this verse is true. And here's why. When we think healing, sometimes our view is limited. I've got a physical ailment. I've got something wrong physically. I want that to be better. I want it to be removed. But here's what we have to understand. Even if it is physical healing, sometimes God heals miraculously and sometimes he doesn't. And we don't know why. If we knew the why to every answer, we wouldn't need faith anyway. Remember, this book is about faith. And because someone wasn't healed doesn't mean they didn't have enough faith. That's ridiculous to take someone who's sick and go, well, you just have enough faith or you would have been healed. I've seen people with faith that makes mine look small, that prayed and they still died. And yet I've seen people also who are full of faith that prayed and had people pray over them. And people that were given three or four months are here 14, 15 years later. Even when Jesus was on earth, He did not heal every single sick person. I would say every single sick person wanted to be healed. In fact, sometimes Jesus would go into a crowd of sick people and pick one out and heal them. I don't know why he did that. I think it's because it helps us keep perspective that life is about more than just living as many years here as possible. It's about so much more than that. Because every person Jesus healed, they still died. 
They were healed temporarily. But if you notice, all of Jesus' healings, what was connected to that was him saying, stop sinning. Don't sin. Leave your life of sin. Yes, Jesus healed a lot of people physically. But 100% of the people that come to him and ask for spiritual healing, they get it every time. So this verse is telling us that we should ask the leaders of our church to pray over us. I was waiting to say, if you're sick, whether it's physical or spiritual, ask the leaders of the church to pray over you. And that prayer will make you well. So the Greek word that James uses for sick is a word that's pronounced astheneo. And it means to be weak, feeble, without strength, or powerless. And then scholars don't agree if it only refers to spiritually sick or does it include spiritual and physically sick. I think it means both, spiritual sickness and physical sickness. What I don't know is why sometimes when I go pray with people, they live much longer than anybody, any medical person thought. And sometimes they don't. Why is that? I don't know. But I know I have the faith that God will. And we just have to have the faith to trust him if the answer is not exactly what we wanted with the timeline that we wanted. So I have seen God heal physically sometimes. (coughs) I've seen him heal spiritually 100% of the time. Every time somebody sincerely comes to God and asks for forgiveness, they receive it 100% of the time. Every time that somebody has said, I have drifted, I need to get my life back on track. I drifted away from what I know is true. I need to get back and be close to God like James talked about in chapter three. Get near God, get near God and he'll get near you. I, I need that back in my life. Every single time somebody's asked for that, they receive it, 100%. Every time I've seen somebody say, my faith is weak and I'm asking God to strengthen it, he does, every time. So what we're gonna do today, something we've never done before at the end of the service, uh, where you're gonna have an opportunity to go to the front of the room over in the far corners or right next to the stage, and there's gonna be people there to pray for you. And there's also gonna be people there to anoint you with oil. And that simply means there's oil and they'll just wipe it on your forehead. Now, what does that mean? It means exactly what it meant in the days when James said it. Now, in their day, oil did have some medicinal purposes, but that's not why he mentioned it. It showed God's provision for people. If you wanna write this verse down, Hebrews chapter one, verse nine, you can learn a little bit more about what it means to be anointed with oil and, and how that relates to the spirit of God. But anointing someone with, oil, someone with oil always represented the spirit of God. Oil has no power, just like water has no power when somebody gets baptized. It's what all of that represents. That's where the power comes from. When we gather around people to pray, like, like when I prayed for Matt earlier, I put my hand on his shoulder. There's something about that physical touch that says, I'm with you, I'm for you, I want to help you. Years ago, I read this study about uh, AIDS babies and their life expectancy, which was short. The babies that got put in a ward and stayed there alone and the nurses doing the best they could to care for them died pretty quickly. But they noticed something. The babies that got held The babies that people said, I'll go hold AIDS babies that nobody wants to hold, those babies live longer. And it had to do with physical touch. And so there's the symbolism of the oil, but there's also the the human touch. Somebody just touching your forehead, saying, I'm with you. God hears you. God sees you. So, Ask us to pray for you today when you have that opportunity. Now, this verse also can be applied to spiritual sickness. So whether you have physical sickness, just because God doesn't heal all the time, doesn't pray you ask for it none of the time. 
I don't know. You, you may have an illness and God could heal you physically. I can't promise that, but I promise he hears your prayers and I promise he will, he will heal you spiritually and you'll be able to accept whatever is coming in your life. And then James shifts to another benefit of the church. In chapter five, <clears throat> where he says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. He starts out saying, therefore, hey, I just told you about all this opportunity for prayer. So therefore, pray for each other. Pray that each other are healed. Faithful prayer brings tangible results. That's what James is trying to tell us. Faithful prayer brings tangible results. And he uses, uh, he brings up the Old Testament prophet Elijah. And Elijah is a great example of praying to God. Elijah prayed in front of King Ahab. King Ahab worshiped foreign gods. One of the gods, Baal, that Ahab worshiped uh, was the God of many things. But one of the things that Ahab was the God of was rain. And so when Elijah says this, when this happens in 1 Kings 17, when he says, when it says, now Elijah the Tishbite was a prophet from the settlers in Gilead. I serve the Lord, the God of Israel. He, so he acknowledged who he serves. Elijah said to Ahab, as surely as the Lord lives, no rain or dew will fall during the next few years unless I command it. He said that to someone who thought he had the God that controlled the rain. Elijah comes along and said, I worship the God of Israel. It's not going to rain for three years. Guess what happened? It didn't rain for three years. It didn't rain until Elijah said it was going to rain. To show Elijah saying, the God I worship is the God that has power. Now, I doubt any of you are off, uh, knowingly worshiping false gods, but people worship false gods all the time. Believe the world can bring them more peace than God can. Believe the world can guide them and pick a topic in, in some topic better than the word of God can. But just like Elijah came and said, let me show you the real God that controls the rain. James is using Elijah as an example because we can say to the world, let me show you the real God that can change me and change lives. And the last things James says, is James 5, beginning at verse 19, when he says, My brothers and sisters, if any one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sin. Some of you in a room this size, watching online, you've wandered from the truth. You've wandered and you're at a place where if you had to say, are you spiritually sick or spiritually well, you would answer, I'm spiritually sick. Some of you are doing and believing things that are more under the control of the God of this world, Satan, than they are under God's control or more in line with the God of this world than the God who created the world. So here's what we want to do. We want to pray over you. If you're watching online, just let us know in the chat and we'll pray for you and we'll contact you if you give us your contact information, continue to pray for you. But as Jamie sings this last song, we're gonna stand up when he starts singing, sing it together. There's gonna be four stations in the room. Like I said, we've never done this before. But I don't wanna teach through James saying, hey, if, you're, if you need prayer, Go to the leaders of the church, let them anoint you with oil and pray over you. So whatever prayer you need, come and get it. Come and ask us. If you don't want to talk to anybody, you can come right here in front of the stage and you can pray just between you and God. <coughs> and as the, you hear the words of the song, 
and you go out to the corners, somebody will just simply put a little oil on your head and they'll pray over whatever you're asking them to pray for. Just quickly tell them and they'll quickly pray for you. And if you need to stay and pray longer, you can do that as everybody else is dismissed. But as we stand, there's going to be people over in that corner by that exit door, people by the baptistry. Then the same thing on this side. Just go to one of those corners or right down near the front of the stage and we will pray for you. Is any one of you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. So whether you need healing or forgiveness or both, we are here for you to pray for you. Let's stand together and enjoy this song together. Thank <laughs> you.